Uh, Senator Sook, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It means a lot. Um, we've said it a few times. I've heard people uh, just really um, appreciate you, but we want to say it again. You've been a man of courage, and you have been uh, someone who's had a backbone that we could look to. Uh, there's a lot of us on this stage that, uh, you know, we, we kind of... Uh, we take the lead sometimes, and sometimes we do great, and other times we do awfully. Um, by God's grace, he's forgiven us, and he's cared for us, but he's pushed us out there. But we need role models, too. And uh, you are one for us and for the Oklahoma Baptists and for everyone in this room. So thank you, brother. Um, with regard to Oklahoma Baptists, there has been, uh, you know, some of our leadership got behind uh, House Bill 1182. We've talked about it quite a bit, but it seems like we've got a lot more Baptists here who haven't been here for the rest of these talks that have been here uh, at the conference. And what I'd like to hear from you is uh, why you didn't support 1182. And uh, let's start there, and then I'd like to talk about um, I'd like to see if you talk about ectopic pregnancy and then if anybody else wants to add to that. All right, so 1182, and it was a very, it was a very political move if you watched it. So on Thursday, the House of Representatives, the, the, the House leader put his name on a bill. They bypassed committee and shoved this uh, huge piece of legislation through dealing with pro-life the first week of session. And then they immediately put out a huge press release from the House with quotes from, you know, uh, Blake Gideon and all these other folks. So it was clearly a bill to just thwart the movement behind Senate Bill 13. And I, subs you know, I, right after that same day, I sent out a press release from my office uh, with some, some quotes from, from various groups in the state, basically condemning that move and that bill in general uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, one thing that that bill does is it essentially takes a doctor's license for a year and finds them $500 for killing a child. That's unacceptable, period. That's all there is to it. Um, so in, in no way does that bill offer equal protection to unborn children. And it's another pro-life move that's going to get struck down by the courts. And so it's a complete waste of time. Uh, so it's unjust. It's not going to work. And they, they didn't criminalize abortion. So they're saying they're going to do that to a doctor for doing something that's already illegal. So since they didn't make abortion illegal, the state cannot revoke a license for a doctor just doing things that, is, that are legal. So it's just, it's, it's sick, but it's almost comical that that was their big push. So that's why I didn't, that's why I didn't support it. So is the, was the bill intentionally written to be self-defeating? You know, know that the history of the bill, and, and they came from a, to make, trying to make a real quick answer to it, way back in the day when, when the Brady Bill passed from the federal government about instant background checks when you buy a firearm, the federal government said until the, the ATF sets up their instant background check system, local sheriffs are going to have to do the background check. Well, a couple sheriffs sued the federal government and said, no, you can't use state officials to enforce federal law, and they won. But the, the fact is, we're talking about a whole separate issue. So that was the, the idea was to take this thing from the Brady Bill and apply it to pro-life issues, um, but it's, it's just not going to work. So I don't know if it was intentionally done to be self-defeating or if it was just some huge oversight uh, errors that, that they went from there and tried to apply it. It was just a stretch. Like a lot of pro-life bills are, they're trying to straddle the fence. They're trying to skirt around Roe v. Wade without attacking it head on. And it, it's just another, it's going to be another failed attempt, just like all these other pro-life bills that will achieve absolutely nothing. Okay. Um, we'll get to the other guys on the stage, but this is really important for us to hear from the horse's mouth. <laughs> um, the, the other question I had for you was about ectopic pregnancies. Because this has been a point of contention for uh, some of the leaders and some of the other folks who have spoke out over this. And ectopic pregnancy, for those of you who don't know, are rare events in pregnancies when the pregnancy, uh, the child is growing in the mother, mother's body somewhere other than the uterus. And it's 
or the womb, and it's either in the fallopian tubes or in the abdominal uh, cavity or very rarely inside of one of her ovaries. And the, the doctor typically considers these pregnancies uh, fatal, so abortion is the prescribed solution. Now, the concern would be that SB 13 would make doctors who perform procedures during ectopic pregnancies murderers and would make the mother liable for murder. Is, is this what SB 13 does? So that it, it's, that's true that that's the rumor, and that's come up with some videos recently uh, saying that that's what it does. And people who say that that's what Senate Bill 13 does, they either didn't read the bill or they're flat out lying. Period. That's all there is to it. So there's a short answer and a long answer. I'll try to hit both of them as quick as I can. Essentially, when it comes to ectopic pregnancies or any type of, of birth anomalies or pregnancy anomalies, what we did with Senate Bill 13 to kind of squelch the whole health issue is we took existing law from, from or existing language from other areas of the health law and it essentially says, and I'll paraphrase, but you'll get it, it basically says a doctor's charged to exhaust all medical possibilities and resources to save both lives. That's all it says. Um, just like if he has two people on the operating table, he has to do everything he can in his medical power and with his medical training to save both lives. That's all, that's all he can do. And so that language immediately just silences anybody who has an issue with the ectopic pregnancy. Now, saying that, the, the current treatment for with a lot of doctors, if they're diagnosed with an ectopic pregnancy, they immediately go in and, and basically kill the baby and remove it. That's kind of standard protocol. That would change, and it would change and not be detrimental for the mom at all. Um, there, you know, if you're diagnosed with an ectopic pregnancy, and I've talked to, to an, an OB that has delivered three of my kids about this extensively. And he said, no, most doctors do, the, do it wrong. First thing you want to do with an ectopic pregnancy is just monitor the mom. Because 99 point something percent of the time, the, the, the baby dies on itself because it's not a, a proper environment to grow. So it, it dies by itself. It's either absorbed in the body or it passes naturally. And there's no murder that actually takes place. It's a, it's just, it naturally miscarries. But the problem is, since our medical industry is set up to not value human life, a lot of times they just don't even let that happen. And keep in mind, there's no danger to the mother whatsoever. Um, there's also been multiple times in history, and now we're kind of getting out into the weeds, but they've actually transplanted ect ectopic pregnancies and relocated them. And it's been successful. But again, all of these different deals go back to all we're asking, and all Senate Bill 13 says, is doctors need to treat every life equally and use their training to save both lives. Are they gonna have to change their practices a little bit? Yes. Is it detrimental or dangerous to the mother at all? Absolutely not. So would Senate Bill 13 charge a mother uh, who has an ectopic pregnancy and that baby deceases and is passed or a doctor who assists her with murder? No, absolutely not. That is not true whatsoever. You need to read the language of the bill and, and educate yourself a little bit more. Thank you. Um, one question for you, uh, Attorney Bradley Pierce. Uh, when we talk about um, laws being uh, put out to criminalize mothers, are laws supposed to be gracious or are they supposed to be just angry? Is, are these the options that are available for laws? <laughs> yeah, thanks for the, the setup there. So, I mean, so laws don't have emotions, right? Laws are just supposed to, to set a standard. You know, a law just says, what is murder intentionally causing the death of a human being, right? Um, and that's not because you're angry. It's because there has to be a standard set. Here's what a crime is. And then each case is then determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Did this person commit this? And if so, then the jury decides what will the penalty be? Or the prosecutor or the grand jury can even decide whether to prosecute or not. So it's not because anybody is angry or anything like that. It's because there has to be a standard set. There has to be protections for life. 
Um, and so it's not to criminalize any people, it's to criminalize the crime and activity. It's to criminalize conduct and to restrain evil. So uh, this is uh, for anybody who would like to answer. Uh, first, how did you end up at a consistent abolition position? Uh, were you born into it like Darren here was at Southern Baptist? <clears throat> or did you come to this position and what, what did it take? What happened? Uh, I, is, is this on? Can you hear me? No. Te testing? No. Well, uh, yeah, I've been a, a pastor for about 28 years, pastored all around the state. Um, and every year preach a sermon on uh, sanctity of human life and supported uh, our senators and representatives and was considered myself pro-life. And I would say that a few years ago, um, one of my church members, who is actually sitting right over there, um, he was a part of the abolitionist movement and began to kind of just ask me some questions and challenge uh, the position that I've just had because every other pastor kind of had that position. And uh, I began to reconsider and rethink uh, my position and... Um, could not continue to support this incrementalist move because it wasn't going anywhere. And it certainly didn't honor God. And so um, I changed, uh, changed my position. And uh, for the last several years, and we've gotten together in the Christ Center churches. And, that, and, and that's one of the things I think that Bill said that I think was very important is that if someone came at me very angry and was yelling at me, I probably would not listen to what they were saying. I probably would, you know, back, be back on my heels. But it took somebody that I loved, uh, somebody uh, that I respected, to kind of come alongside of me and just talk to me, and that completely changed my position. And I'd like to say one other thing about that. I read a book uh, a year or two ago uh, by James uh, Moore, M-O-H-R, Abortion in America, and he does a great job researching the history of abortion. And I didn't realize before I, I read this book that abortion was legal in the 1800s, um, in the 1840s and 50s and 60s, it was legal. <laughs> and it was, the, it, was the, it was the physicians, it was the doctors that were upholding the Hippocratic Oath that was really pushing the state legislators to end abortion in each state. At that time, the federal government was not really uh, the power, so they had to go to each state. And so the American Medical Association was lobbying um, against abortion. So were many of the newspapers, including, I kid you not, the New York Times was lobbying uh, to, to end abortion. And they had a hard, difficult time doing that. It, was, it took them a long time. And then they got to about the 1880s, uh, and the doctors were putting pressure on the pastors. The churches were silent. The pastors were silent. Mm. Um, and finally, they began to get traction with the Catholic Church, the Congregationalist Church, and then the Presbyterians. They get, began to get some traction there. And it was only after they got the traction with the churches and with the pastors did they finally get the states to pass laws against abortion. And those were the laws, by the way, uh, many of them similarly worded or, or rephrased over time, but those are the same laws on the books in 73 with Roe versus Wade. It was the Texas law that the Supreme Court was going after. So I would say uh, we need to do all of these things that you've heard, <clears throat> but if you are a church member and your pastor is just kind of going along, well, love him. I mean, don't just, you know, come alongside of him and help to convince him 
that he needs to be uh, against abortion and call for the ending abor of abortion now. Um, and it's, I think that this whole thing will turn. That's why we're here. This whole thing will turn when all the pastors and all the Christians stand up and say, end it now. That's what it will end. Dusty tells me to say my name. My name's Brett Baggett. I'm a pastor in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Okie from Muskogee. So I, I'm proud to be an Okie from Muskogee. About five years ago, we had a Sanctity of Life Sunday, and I preached. And I remember specifically I said one thing that later I go, oh, okay. Sometimes I say things that I shouldn't go that far. But I said, we need to pull our heads out. And it turns out that I was the one that needed to do that because my views were just inconsistent with the Scripture. And so in changing to an abolitionist point of view, it really just came with my presuppositions being challenged and my views being challenged and people showing me from the Scriptures that it's inconsistent. We shouldn't make peace with our government giving a thumbs up to certain people that they're able to murder others. It's just inconsistent. When Psalm 82, the Lord comes in and is holding judgment over the judges and says, how long will you show partiality to the wicked? In Romans 13, as our great attorney has said, is saying that God instituted governments to be a terror to the evildoer. A terror. Phobos, we're phobia, that's where we get our word. It means the government should strike fear in the evildoer so that they won't do it. We don't want to criminalize people. We want to say you can't do it. And once that started happening and you just go to the scriptures, my mind started changing and I saw, what? why did I believe what I believed? And mostly it was because I believed what the secular pro-life establishment had told me. So if you haven't, I'll, I'll do this real quickly. If you haven't read The Doctrine of Balaam by Callie, get it and read it. This is something I wish I would have had five years ago. But if you haven't read it, read it. And then as many copies as you can purchase, purchase them and give them to everyone, especially your pastor. If you're in a church... Like Pastor Billy was saying, that give it to your pastor and lovingly see if he'll read it with you or all of your elders. Read it. Um, it's biblical. It's sharp, but in the good kind of way that puts thorns in your side that you will have to pluck out only by further study. It makes assertions. Callie, Callie makes assertions. And they're very helpful. So things like that. Being challenged with what the scripture says and, and the constant refrain in this book is, did God really say? Are we going to say that or are we just going to say it on, thus says the Lord? And, and that's what we know we should do. So for me, that's how it changed. I was challenged and I had to rethink what I believed and I was challenged with the scripture. So. Um. Did you say during the speech? I don't know. Quickly, yeah, I was on the, engaged in uh, the Louisiana legislature lobbying them for a clean bill. I told you that Friday night, and I was a pro-lifer, committed pro-lifer. But I discovered through the years that we were using the same vocabulary, but a very different dictionary. Hmm. For me, pro-life meant every baby is sacred. There's no excuse ever to execute a baby in the womb. And so last year, it reached fever pitch. When I learned about SB 13, I got all excited. And then our Baptist leadership came out going a very different direction. And I said, well, nuts. I don't want to be known as a pro-lifer anymore. I'm an abolitionist. Uh, principled, principled. So that was what it was for me. I've been involved in this for decades, but, uh, but we're marching under a banner that, that's torn terribly apart. I pray for the day in this nation when pro-life means every life is sacred. It means something. But right now, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a term that's being used that, that doesn't mean what it ought to mean.
You, you guys want to? Yeah, so mine, mine's a, a pretty normal story. I, I was elected in uh, 2014. I was 27 uh, years old, went up to the uh, my first session, authored a pain-capable act. Basically, you can't kill your baby if it can feel pain, but if it can't, you're good to go. And I thought that was just a great bill. Uh, the pro-life lobby came and discouraged me from running that. They said it was too aggressive, which immediately wrote, you know, raised some red flags for me. I was like, you got a freshman senator wanting to attack this issue, and you're discouraging him from doing that. Uh, the very following year, I met a couple guys, Russell Hunter and Josh Malone from you know, the, uh, some abolitionists here in, in Oklahoma, within like 10 minutes uh, in my office at the Capitol, this is just like a light bulb went off. And I was like, oh, yeah, you're exactly right. Um, you know, the, the pro-life legislation is doing more harm than good. And it was just kind of a practical thing for me. I mean, biblically, yes, I, I completely agree. But I was just, you know, we've been doing this for almost 50 years, put millions of dollars behind it, had hundreds of thousands of volunteers, and we've gotten nowhere one of the most conservative states in the union, we're still killing 14 babies a year. That's just insane. And so this is the only way to go. And that, that, that was how I, I mean, it was very quick, five, 10 minute conversation. And I understood it. Yeah. I mean, I've always been pro-life growing up, but, but um, you know, I wasn't ambivalent about a lot of the pro-life bills because it seems like we were conceding principles in a lot of them. So I was always like, oh, I don't know if I support that. But I had a friend in 2015 that got, um, he helped someone get elected and he became chief of staff and his boss actually told him, hey, go to the pro-life organizations here in Texas and ask them, if I were to just file a bill to completely outlaw abortion, what would your position on that be? And my friend did that and he came back and told his boss what they said and then he came and told me what they said. And he said that when he asked them that, would you support a bill that completely outlawed abortion? The pro-life organizations of Texas told him, not only would we not support that, we would oppose it. And that's whenever I, basically that's when I became an abolitionist. I'll just say something very briefly um, about how I moved from a pro-life position to an abolition position. Uh, we had a couple abolitionists uh, coming to our church, uh, Josh Wall and a couple and another. And um, we had lots of conversations and I thought that yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty consistent. I think I hold to some of those. I don't know if I hold to that fervor. Um, but then, so there was a framework, a context that God was putting in place. So then last year when uh, the Baptist General Convention of Oklahoma, which is now the Oklahoma Baptist, uh, came out against SB 13 and their, their reason, their rationale were extremely weak. Uh, they were... They had no shred of biblical worth, and uh, it it just it was so inconsistent and and dumbfounding to us. We got together and, and we cut a video, and after that, uh, some others uh, started reaching out to us, uh, and uh, Russell Hunter was one of those, and some others, um, and. By God's grace, uh, I'm, I'm sitting here uh, today, um, and what I'd like to say is I, I'm an unworthy servant serving a, a supremely worthy master, and most of you, many of you, uh, perhaps all of you, have done more in uh, the, for the cause of, of life and babies than I have. And uh, I, I just sit here, hope, hopefully helping give you a voice, uh, because there are many who, I, who I've started to follow on Facebook and started listening and seeing and, and learning uh, about what you were doing and saw the courage of our senator. Uh, and God used you. Uh, and I was uh, trolling. Well, not so much trolling, but just, uh, what is it? You, Follow people stalking, uh, just <laughs> hanging out in the background, hanging about, hang. I wasn't trolling. Yeah, no, not trolling. I was hanging out in the background of these uh, of your Facebook pages and seeing what are they doing, how are they talking about this, and learning. And God used you, so I, I'm so thankful for so many of you who are here. Um, another question uh, would be, what is it that do you guys think are keeping people 
I guess there's a couple different groups, but answer it where you will, whether it's people in the pews or people in the pulpits, uh, from crossing over into a consistent ethic of life and holding an abolition position. Uh, there's one main thing that I hear over and over again, and I hear it a lot here in Oklahoma since I've been here too. And I, it's the elephant in the room, so let's just go ahead and throw it out there, because that's what I like to do. So it's a, one thing that really keeps people away is the way that they've been treated by an abolitionist in the past. Somebody came to my church, somebody was out holding a sign, somebody spoke too harshly toward me or something like that. Here's what I would say about that. So there's two groups of people in the room. There's seasoned abolitionists and there's people that are new to the movement. I would say uh, to the seasoned abolitionists, the agitation worked, the room is full, right? Praise God, yeah. right? I know that's not the thing, that's not to say that everything any abolitionist ever did was good. I think we all would agree with that, amen? But I do think that sometimes abolitionists need to rebuke, need to repent of being overly harsh and unnecessarily, unnecessarily hostile. And that has created problems, but sometimes it's also brought people into the movement. The second thing I would say is to the people that are new in the room, I would say run to that conflict and not away from it because babies are being murdered. So don't let, your, don't let yourself continue to remain apathetic because somebody said something mean to you. Maybe it was mean and maybe they need to repent, but babies are still being murdered. And this is what Christ would have us to do. And so uh, I say that because I came to this movement because a brother who I love now drove me nuts at first. He'd do these live videos named Brian Shrank. He'd do these live videos every freaking Friday when I was trying to sleep in. I'm at the abortion mill, where are the pastors at? You know, and here I am a pastor and I'm like, oh, because my conscience was, see, like my conscience was bothered by what he was saying. And, and everything he said to me probably wasn't always good and I can guarantee you everything I said to him wasn't always good. But you know what, by the grace of God, God brought me into this battle through that. And uh, it's by God's grace that I didn't run away and toured because my general inclination is just to start throwing punches. But I would say to the brothers and sisters on both sides of that, run to that conflict and not away from it. Because we need to have that discussion and babies are being murdered so don't let those issues chase you away from doing that which Christ has called you to do. I think that uh, folks have not been trained to think objectively and rationally. Too many people emote. And abortion is a very emotional issue. When you start throwing things like, well, what about rape? What about incest? What about if a mother's life is in danger? And, and there, are, there are very biblical and reasonable arguments to speak to that. And I think Senator Silk speaks as clearly as anybody about the life of the mother. But folks are not trained to do that. So we've got to somehow cut through the emotion. We, we've got to help them think about what they're saying. You know, the, you know the arguments. I don't need to even give them to you because everyone sitting here knows them. But they are, they are there and they're reasonable. So if we can help ourselves be reasonable and, and winsome in our approach and then help others come to a reasonable position, most people, the light will come on. Now there's some folks that don't, they don't want to hear it. Uh, we're not talking about them. We're talking about the vast majority of people who uh, people in the pew, who when, when, when I preach abolition, I know I've got some folks sitting there thinking, but pastor, what about, what if a woman was raped and conceived as a result of that? And we, that's where we teach God's providence, God's sovereignty. God opens the womb and, and help them understand that you don't, you don't execute a child for the crime of one of his parents. You just teach, you teach that way. So I think, I think we're dealing with a real uh, emotional issue where most people that approach it emote in the midst of it. Our, our challenge is to bring our reasonable faith to that. And I think that, that wins in the end. Guys? I think uh, a part of this, also as Southern Baptists, you know, we have the associations and then we have the larger and I think part of this is if you stick your head up 
somebody's going to want to chop it off, you know, and uh, and you don't want to rock the boat and you don't want your association to think, oh, you're that troublemaker or, you know, the state. So there's a little bit of fear involved uh, in that as far as pastors are concerned. Uh, but I'm a Calvinist, so I'm used to kind of being isolated and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I've learned that um, if you don't do anything, the devil will leave you alone out of respect. You know, you're not bothering him, so he's not going to bother you. And if you're not getting incoming fire, and if somebody's not threatening your life or want to chop your head off, you're not doing anything. So just get out there. The Lord will take care of your soul. You go to heaven when you die and relax there. Just go out and do it. Just do it. Get over that fear. I think most people aren't abolitionists because they don't understand the truths behind it. That's pretty much it, I think. That's a large majority of it. People haven't been challenged to think through the positions that they hold. Um, for instance, we had uh, Sanctity of Life Sunday night. We titled that on purpose because we wanted people to come and then basically argue from the scripture that we should be working for abolition. We had a new couple that was visiting our church for a few weeks and the, the woman volunteers at the Pregnancy Resource Center there in our town. They visited there in their 60s. Most of our church are in our 30s, 40s. They came, listened, and right at the end they said, we'll be at Abolition Day. I had no idea. People don't even have any idea that those, when they scroll through their Facebook feed and see talk about pro-life things, they have no idea that if you ask those people, should it just be illegal to murder a baby, that they will say, well, they would say it should be illegal for someone, to, for an abortionist to kill the baby. But when you let them know that, well, Ben Shapiro's asked this, and should the woman be criminalized for murdering her baby, and he says, no. When most of the people that they know that are the pro-life voices, they have no idea that they would say, no, the woman shouldn't be prosecuted. And so they have no idea that they're not arguing for equal justice and just protection for all of life. And so when you start to educate people on it, most people, especially people who believe the Bible, you argue from the scripture too, and even just rationally, as Senator Silk was saying, that's how he came to it. People don't know, so go and talk to people. Go and talk to your pastor. Give him Callie's book, The Doctrine of Balaam, and talk to him and work through questions and then encourage him to preach the truth, to hold a separate day than your normal worship gathering and tell people the truth from the word and that we should call our government to do what God says he instituted them to do. And if they don't do that, then try to figure out why. R.C. Sproul said is the book that he wrote that had the Shortest shelf life was his book on abortion, and he had many pastors talk to him, and they say, we love the book, but we can't preach this in our church, we can't do this, and R.C. asked them why, and they said, because it would split the church in two. And R.C. says, he said, so be it. So we just need to stand up for the truth, and even if that splits churches, these as Darren has said repeatedly, babies are still being murdered, and our government gives a thumbs up to it. Okay, last question, and everybody gets like, oh, there's a couple guys over here who are asked to ask questions. You guys have a question? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Uh, my question is, I guess we all kind of understand how the United States Supreme Court has been involved with these, with these bills, and what we're expecting for SB 13 if it goes to the United States Supreme Court. But what role does the state Supreme Court play in this? I, I understand that there was a bill maybe five years ago that's been kind of on hold by the state Supreme Court. So what, what are we expecting from them on, on SB 13 and, and how can we affect that with our voice or you know what can we do to help with that? So the state Supreme Court is actually more liberal than the, than the U.S. Supreme Court. And when Senate Bill 13 is passed and signed into law, 
absolutely the state, the Oklahoma State Supreme Court will say that's unconstitutional. And that's when the legislature and the governor says, no, it's not, you're wrong, we're gonna enforce the law. So it's the exact same thing. Uh, they're completely wrong in, under the, in their interpretation of the Constitution. So in, in the Oklahoma Constitution, Article 2, Section 2 and 7, we guarantee a right to life. And for some reason, they don't view that as a right to life. So we would have to have the people of Oklahoma through the legislature and the executive branch enforce the law and uphold the Constitution regardless. It's the, it, the exact same way when the, when the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that slaves were private property and had no rights, they were wrong and we abolished slavery. We got to do the exact same thing, whether it be the state Supreme Court or the federal Supreme Court um, with this idea. Yeah, I'll speak just briefly to that because that question does come up a lot. Yeah, okay, I understand the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't have authority. But what about the state Supreme Court? And it is, it's really just the exact same issue, right? The, the only way that a court can quote unquote strike down a law is if there's a higher law that trumps it. Well, the only higher law than statutes passed by the legislature would be the state constitution or the U.S. Constitution. So is there something in there that says that a woman has a right to an abortion or that states can't outlaw abortion? No. So if the court says that there is, they're the ones who are ignoring the law. And so whether it be the state Supreme Court or the U.S. Supreme Court, you ignore them and enforce the law anyway, consistent with the constitutions. Thank you very much. So this is for anyone who feels led, but I really wanted to focus on Senator Silk. Um, as someone who's in politics, what are some of the biggest forms of spiritual warfare you've seen, and how do you cope with that? It's a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, you, you, you do. You're, uh, most of the encounters that I have uh, really do hinge on spiritual warfare. Um, you're talking about a conservative Baptist boy, uh, but I've been doing this for six years, and in January, before session starts, the spiritual warfare in my personal life and with my family skyrocket. Um, that's just all there is to it. There is a hierarchy of demonic spirits that, uh, that are in play. Um, and when you engage the political realm or, and a lot of guys, these guys can say, when you engage culture and try to tear down demonic strongholds, you're going to face it uh, big time. You will. Uh, I have a, tremendous uh, relationship with my wife uh, and I have a very tight-knit family and that's how that helps to cope with that and you know just through prayer and perseverance it's gonna be there I know it's there every year everybody does uh, but you just you just struggle through okay question of uh, the, the pastor next to brother uh, Bill Asko uh, you, you, right, to, to his left, of the yes. last one. You mentioned a book uh, yes. about uh, abortion in America, how it, they were trying to criminalize it. What, do you remember, what was the name of that book? Yeah, the, the book uh, it was called Abortion in America by James uh, Moore, M-O-H-R. Uh, Marvin Olasky also has Abortion Rights. It's another book uh, that, that does the history of abortion. Uh, boy, it's really good to read some of those and get your mind wrapped around the history okay. of it, going back into the 1800s and, and figuring out how we got here. And that kind of helps us to plot a way to how to continue on. Yeah. Okay. We, abortion, uh, the churches and pastors and a lot of people working together made abortion illegal in the 1870s, 1880s. Um, but we can do it again. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate it. To the same, excuse me, to the same pastor. And I found that interesting. I was always, I'm from Wisconsin. I was wondering why uh, it was on the books of Wisconsin to outlaw abortion already. And that was before the white supremacist Margaret Sanger, you know? Right. But anyway, to my question, um, you said there was just questions just brought gently to you that helped you come from the typical pro-life to the yeah. abolitionist. What questions that stand out that really convinced you to really go forward with your cause here? Well, I think it was just pointing out, well, you know, Stephen's over here. He could tell you what the questions were. <laughs> he just kept, he said I was wrong. So uh, that, that started it. Uh, but uh, I, think, I think just um, 
saying, okay, pro-life, um, how, how's that working out for you? You know, Dr. Phil kind of a thing, you know, uh, how's that going? Well, you know, it's still going. And, uh, you know, my family had been, uh, engaged in abortion. My aunt actually, uh, helped found the crisis pregnancy centers. Uh, and she was head over that in Atlanta, Georgia for the Southern Baptist for years. Um, Sylvia Booth was her name. And so just growing up under her passion to save the little babies um, really rubbed off on me and, and my family. And I didn't know there was another alternative, you know, pro-life, I, I want to save the babies. And, but I, we kept putting the people in there that were just stalling or not doing anything. And I think, I think just saying, you know, think about it, and uh, let's look at, you know, I knew the scriptures that, it, that abortion was murder. I didn't have to educate me on that. Uh, but I think that just, just uh, you know, holding the, the legislation to account, uh, to using God's laws, just, I think also just understanding that Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Period. I mean... Uh, so anybody that rules anything different from the authority of Christ is wrong, and we have to we have to stand against it. And so, just those things just went off in my head, and that completely changed my approach to it. But thank you for asking him. So I have a couple of pastors in my area that are wonderful men, and we'd love to see get involved. They're right on the fence line, and as pastors, I was wondering what would be a good approach to humbly come to them and encourage them when they consider themselves apolitical. Stab at it. I'll try my best. <laughs> um, it's kind of, in a certain sense, it's difficult to answer the question because in some ways it depends on why they're apolitical. You know, there are certain doctrinal realities that sometimes cause pastors to become pietistic and apolitical. What I mean when I say that is piety is good, but pietism is bad. Pietism is the idea that we should withdraw from society. Uh, and so that would be the theology, uh, the worst end of the theology that says, well, it's the five of us, let's hold, off, hold on in here until Jesus comes back. And sometimes it's that theology that causes pastors to be pietistic and so forth. And um, that's a very difficult situation to work through. You gotta pray for that pastor. Um, books like Pastor Callie's book, um, would be good. Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrate. You can always give pastors books because they generally like to read. Um, and so you can say, here's a free book and you'll be like their best friend. So, you know, that's a good way to start. Hey, Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrate. Um, I know that uh, Brother Matt's got some back there. Uh, he doesn't give me a cut of that, but we'll negotiate that later. Um, Pastor Callie's book over here. Get some copies of those and get those into their hands and I think that'll help. If they're just being lazy, sometimes it's just like there's a facade of theological truth and then there's for pastors either they're lazy or they're busy and i would say this to the abolitionists in the room busy does not always if a pastor tells you he's busy it doesn't necessarily mean that he's lazy he may be busy and so like that's an important thing to say in this room and i don't care if you're mad at me you can beat me up outside like sometimes he's busy and if he's busy then you have to help him understand that this should be a priority this should be on his priority list Babies are getting murdered in your community. You need to make it a priority. And you have to do it with love and grace and a willingness to continue to go back like the woman in the parable that we've talked about so many times today. Sometimes you have to do with pastors just what you do with magistrates in that instance. Okay, uh, that, th thank you for asking a question. That'll be the last question. Uh, we are going to end after one thing. We are Oklahoma Baptists. We aimed this largely at Oklahoma Baptists because Oklahoma Baptists have been so uh, instrumental in mostly negative ways the past couple of years. And uh, we want to see that changed. We want to uh, see Oklahoma Baptists repent and hold a consistent ethic that's God glorifying in this. I think for many of us, uh, you know, fish don't really question the water that they swim in. And that was the case for me. Uh, that was probably the case for, for everyone up here. We had to have someone ask us and talk to us. Hey, have you thought about the water that you're swimming in and the air that you're breathing? Uh, that happened for my family and I during uh, whenever we found out about birth control, being a board of fashion. Uh, and we got off of birth control. 
because uh, we didn't even want to be potential murderers. Uh, so maybe the last thing, uh, very short, very short, 15 seconds, 30 seconds. What would you say to the Oklahoma Baptists who are watching? Some of you might want to speak to the leadership. Some of you might want to speak to the pastors. Some of you might want to speak to those in the, in the pews. What would you say? All of you. Okay. I think Darren said it earlier. We repented over slavery. It's past time to repent about abortion. Okay. Uh, I have talked to some of them. I have to believe that they really do want to see abortion ended. I think it's a matter of uh, tactics and all that. I would encourage my brothers in, in leadership at Oklahoma Baptist is um, don't play politics. Be a prophetic voice to the culture, to the state, and let's all together say, stop it, let's end it. And I think that's when we finally will see this thing ended. Fifteen seconds. There's another way than the secular pro-life movement, and it's being an abolitionist. Just stand up and have compassion for babies. And stop asking, we need to have compassion on these people and these people, and forget the fact that babies are still being murdered, and we are essentially approving of it if all we do is try to pass heartbeat bills. There's another way. Call our government to abolish abortion. Forty-seven years and 65 million plus dead babies are enough proof to show that incrementalism isn't working. And just as the people who sang as the trains were passing by and the people who brushed the ashes off of their bodies and out of their hair whenever the fires at Auschwitz were putting the ashes in the sky and they were falling on the townspeople and they said, well, we didn't know. They had no excuse. And if the Nuremberg trials told us anything, they had no excuse. And all that it takes for evil to continue to promulgate is for good men, courageous, is for, or for, for cowardly men to stand by and do nothing. So we need brave men and brave women like so many of you abolitionists and like our brothers who are pastors and our senator and our attorney who are here. Be brave men. Stand with God. Let him be your judge and matter not what people say. Well, the first thing I just want to say is thank you to you guys. Like, this is your stage. This is your state. So I really appreciate you inviting me to be up here with you. Um, the thing that I would say to the Oklahoma, the leaders of the Oklahoma Baptist Convention is that God has put you in this position for this time. You have an opportunity to literally change the course of history, to right a wrong that's been happening for 47 years. God has providentially put you in this place for this time. Don't squander it. And I say that uh, as a brother who loves you, we're all gonna stand before the Lord and give an answer. Don't waste this opportunity. Do what's right before God. I, I would encourage the leadership of the Baptists um, and pastors out there to, to look into the future because abortion will be ended soon and it's gonna be ended through a total and immediate abolition. And when that happens, when your kids or your grandkids ask you what role you played in that, make sure you have something good to say. I would just, I would just ask, are you voting Republican? Are you voting for Republican presidents so they'll appoint justices to overturn Roe? And if you are, on what basis do you want them to overturn Roe? It's because you believe it's unconstitutional. Well, there's only one bill that actually treats Roe like it's unconstitutional. Yeah. 
and it's SB 13. And if you believe Roe's un unconstitutional and should be overturned, then let's act like it and support the only bill that treats it that way. Thank you all. Yeah. If you are a pastor and you don't have a copy of this, meet me in the back and I'll give you a copy. Okay? Packets by each of the doors. So you don't have to be a pastor, but if you know you can give one of these to your pastor, there are packets with information about SB 13 as well as a copy of the Doctrine of Balaam for free. All right, we're going to pray for Senator Silk. Um, he's going to come here. We're all going to uh, lay hands on him. If you want to join us, you're welcome to. Um, Josh, do you have some? Okay. Okay. Let's let's pray for Senator Silk. If you want to come up, uh, lay your hands on him, and that's great. Um, if you want to stand where you are and pray, that's what we'll do. Let's bow together. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're bowed before you in Jesus' name, the name above every name. We recognize you're the God who is sovereign in providence. We believe with all of our hearts that you have brought this brother to this time to be your man in our legislature. So, Father, as we've talked about tonight, we, we repent of backwardness. We repent of sluggardliness, and we pray that the fruit of our repentance will be that we will be behind SB 13, uh, that we will speak of it, we will encourage this brother as he faces discouragement. We pray for those, his colleagues, that you will turn their hearts, that you will open their eyes, that we will see a move of God sweep across our legislature. And that before we come to summer, we can shout praise to God for what He has done. So we pray for this brother. We know he's under the attack of Satan. We know the one who loves to kill hates what is going on. The father of lies is busy at work. But I pray that you will protect this brother. Give many to stand and speak the truth on his behalf. May he know that there are many in the gap interceding for him. And give him a boldness that he has never known before. That when he speaks, he speaks with authority. People in his presence will know that, that take note that you are with him. Honor his efforts. Give to him and to us the collective desires of our hearts. And let us see, very soon we pray, the babies in Oklahoma safe from the butcher's knife. But we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.